All right, so today we're going to talk about kinship. Kinship is basically those people to whom you are related. And it seems like it would be a pretty simple thing. Why would you have to study kinship? If somebody's related to you, they're related to you. Well, it's because around the world people are related in different ways. And even if they're related in the same ways that you are, they approach it differently. And so when we talk about kinship, we're talking about both custom, in some cases law, and in some, some cases uh, just preferences. So kinship is the organizing principle by which we decide who's into what social group, what role they have within that social group, and all the categories dealing with parenting, dealing with um, uh, the care of children, the uh, inheritance, all of these things are, are dealt with under the concepts of uh, kinship. One of the first things that kinship does is it allows, um, it facilitates the transmission of culture from one generation to the next. And I've said over and over and over, where do we begin to learn our culture? We begin to learn it on our mother's knee. Well, then there's nothing more related to that than you're related to your mother, right? And so kinship has a lot to do with how culture is transmitted from generation to generation. Kinship also, as I said before, has a lot to do with the caring and the education of children. One of the more important things throughout history is the transfer of property. Who inherits? Today, you know, basically all of us figure, well, you know, we've got, we live in a, a community property state, so if you're married and you die, your wife gets everything or your husband gets everything. Unless you leave a will, and then you can specify where, where your stuff is going to go. Didn't used to be the case. Many cultures have proscriptions as to this is how you dispose of the wealth. For much of, of European history, they used the law of progenitorship. In other words, the first son, even if he's the youngest of 15 kids, is the one who inherits everything, including the responsibility to care for the other siblings and his, his, and his mother. So a lot of this, again, is, has to do with, with kinship. Kinship also is the list of people you can go to for help. Now, every family has its, its parameters. Uh, some families may be more helpful than others, but essentially, that's the first place you go. And depending on your particular family and your particular culture, you may have a large number of people to draw on, or you may be very American and have almost nobody. Right? A lot of it depends on, on basically the culture within your family. It also sets up what we refer to as structures of sentiment. Right? You've probably got first and second cousins that you know pretty well, and you'd say, yeah, I love them. Right? They're, they're, they are, it's not romantic love, unless it's your first cousin, but um, it's, uh, there, there, are feeling, there are emotions. There are um, things you feel about members of your family, right? And so that, but defining who is in that family has a lot to do with how you spend those emotions. Kinships can be set up around a set of fairly limited rules. There are lots and lots and lots of different ways that kinship is set up. And there are lots of combinations of rules. So the majority of this lecture is going to be terminology. It's just going to be, this is the word we use to define this. You may not have even known that this ever existed, but we got a word for it. So I'm going to go through a lot of terms in this lecture. Uh, for, the, for our one major, this will help you cement it in your brain, hopefully. Uh, and for the rest of you, a lot of these terms may come in useful as you're moving forward. And one of the reasons why this is important for applied anthropology is some of you are going to be working with the public. Right? You're going to be dealing, some of you are going to be dealing with people, uh, in, in some of you that are crim majors. You're going to be dealing with both victims and uh, perps. And it, family may play a role in that. If you're a liberal, a liberal studies major, you're going to be a teacher. Well, you're going to be dealing with the product of families. And you have to understand, why is the uncle always showing up? You know, I can't talk to the uncle. I need a mom or a dad. Why is the uncle always showing up? Well, it might come from a culture where the education of the children falls on the uncle, not the father. There are cultures like that. But you need to know that, right? And so that's one of the reasons why all these basic lectures kind of get thrown into this class, because you need to know these basics in order to do anthropology. Membership in a kinship group is not necessarily voluntary. 
I will give you an example that is, but most of the time, your culture determines whether you're in that group or not. So there are three primary types of kinship relationships. The first one is blood, consanguinal. You can't really see that. It didn't show up very well. Sorry about that. Um, but it's got sangre in there, sangre being blood, right? Blood relations. Even your, our definition of blood can vary from culture to culture. Normally, this has to do with the birth parents. That's why the blood matters. Or it might only be one of the parents. The second we call a finial. And this is those people that you're related to by marriage, by adoption, or by any other legal matter, right? You officially are family, but you did it through a legal process, right? This is why your in-laws are your in-laws even if you, after your divorce. Unfortunately, you can't get rid of them. I'm trying to get rid of them while I'm still married, but working on it. I'm getting better, getting closer all the time. There are only a couple left in town. Colorado's filling up. I'm getting rid of most of them. Uh, it's a whole long story. And then the third and final, and that is fictive. And many of you may have people that you consider to be fictive family. They're just like your brother or your sister or a family friend that's just like an uncle. Those are the creepy ones, but you've got to be careful. Um, you know, maybe it isn't a creepy one this time. They're people that, are, that behave like they're your family to whom you can turn to like your family. I have a weird family. I have a half-sister. She has another half-brother. We, the two of us, have a stepsister who had a half-brother. Try to figure that one out, right? Um, lots and lots of people getting married to lots and lots of other people and making babies. And we're all somehow related. Um, but because we're all halves and steps, we have a great relationship. We see each other about twice a year. Everything's cool. Right? My true family are people that I've known for years and years and years. And when I have a problem, I can go to them. I don't go to my stepsister or my half-sister. Number one, they probably can't help me. And two, I'd feel weird going. I mean, that, that, that's strange to say. I would feel weirder going to my actual blood or, and, and even uh, affinial relatives than I would going to my fictive re relatives, people that I've, I have brought into my family. It says, okay, you are now my brother. You are now my, my cousin or whatever. So these are the things types. written and said about marriage, from the sweetly inspirational to the hilariously cynical. But what many of them have in common is that they sound like they express a universal and timeless truth, when in fact, nearly everything about marriage, from its main purpose, to the kinds of relationships it covers, to the rights and responsibilities involved, has varied greatly between different eras, cultures, and social classes. So let's take a quick look at the evolution of marriage. Pair bonding and raising children is as old as humanity itself. With the rise of sedentary agricultural societies about 10,000 years ago, marriage was also a way of securing rights to land and property by designating children born under certain circumstances as rightful heirs. As these societies became larger and more complex, marriage became not just a matter between individuals and families, but also an official institution governed by religious and civil authorities. And it was already well established by 2100 BC when the earliest surviving written laws in the Mesopotamian Code of Ur-Namu provided many specifics governing marriage, from punishments for adultery to the legal status of children born to slaves. Many ancient civilizations allowed some form of multiple simultaneous marriage, and even today, less than a quarter of the world's hundreds of different cultures prohibit it. But just because something was allowed doesn't mean it was always possible. Demographic realities, as well as the link between marriage and wealth, meant that even though rulers and elites in ancient Mesopotamia, Egypt, and Israel had multiple concubines or wives, most commoners could only afford one or two, tending towards monogamy in practice. In other places, the tables were turned, and a woman could have multiple husbands, as in the Himalayan mountains, where all brothers in a family marrying the same woman kept the small amount of fertile land from being constantly divided into new households. Marriages could vary not only in the number of people they involved, but the types of people as well. Although the names and laws for such arrangements may have differed, 
publicly recognized same-sex unions have popped up in various civilizations throughout history. Mesopotamian prayers included blessings for such couples, while Native American two-spirit individuals had relationships with both sexes. The first instances of such arrangements actually being called marriage come from Rome, where the emperors Nero and Elagabalus both married men in public ceremonies, with the practice being explicitly banned in 342 AD. But similar traditions survived well into the Christian era, such as adelphopoiesis or brother-making in Orthodox churches, and even an actual marriage between two men recorded in 1061 at a small chapel in Spain. Nor was marriage even necessarily between two living people. Ghost marriages, where either the bride or groom were deceased, were conducted in China to continue family lineages or appease restless spirits, and some tribes in Sudan maintained similar practices. Despite all these differences, a lot of marriages throughout history did have one thing in common. With crucial matters like property and reproduction at stake, they were way too important to depend on young love. Especially among the upper classes, matches were often made by families or rulers. But even for commoners who had some degree of choice, the main concern was practicality. The modern idea of marriage as being mainly about love and companionship only emerged in the last couple of centuries. With industrialization, urbanization, and the growth of the middle class, more people became independent from large extended families and were able to support a new household on their own. Encouraged by new ideas from the Enlightenment, people began to focus on individual happiness and pursuits rather than familial duty or wealth and status, at least some of the time. And this focus on individual happiness soon led to other transformations, such as easing restrictions on divorce and more people marrying at a later age. So as we continue to debate the role and definition of marriage in the modern world, it might help to keep in mind that marriage has always been shaped by society, and as a society's structure, values, and goals change over time, its ideas of marriage will continue to change along with them. So, here's some basic rules. Who can you marry? Who can you not marry? Who decides? Every culture has these three rules. Every culture has to answer those as they decide to build a family. Now, there are very few universals in the world, but one of the true universals is the sibling incest rule. Now, there's no biological reason to not have offspring with your sister. In fact, those of you in ag probably know that the best way to keep a, a nice solid strain is to take two siblings and mate them together. Throughout history, people have married their sisters and their brothers. Uh, usually it's a royal thing, it's something that, that, that the royals do. That's why they all get recessive chins and kind of strange-ass stuff. But um, most societies, 99.999% of societies, do prohibit brothers and sisters from marrying. Most do not prevent cousins from marrying. So here in California, we're one of 21 states where you can marry your first cousin. So if you're kind of, you know, blowing out on the dating scene, <laughs> you only have to fill one side of the church. <laughs> you know all the same people, right? Make it easy, yeah. Date your first cousin. I actually was joking with one of my first cousins one time we were talking about this. She got all freaked out. I was like, no, no, I was just making a joke. I was just, I mean, it's true, but it was a joke, right? I wasn't like saying we should, but cousins are weird. So, the taboo, the incest taboo, specifically goes to siblings. All right, so now, very often there are restrictions placed on who you can marry that are based on the group. So most times if there is a restriction based on the group, it is what we refer to as endogamous. It's within the group, and that group could be your religion, your caste, or your class, which are two different things, your race, your ethnicity, whatever. Maybe you have the same high school, or you lived in the same town, or whatever. You know, I'm only going to marry somebody from, and then you limit it, right? If it's something, if it's your individual preference, that's not counted in here. But if, you, if, if, if it is expected that you will only marry within your, whichever group it happens to be, uh, that is an endogamous relationship. An exon exonymous relationship is where you marry outside the group. You're not allowed to marry inside the group. And so in hunting and gathering groups, in some small-scale societies, in uh, village life, very often you don't marry within the group. 
you go outside to add some depth and breadth to your gene pool. Uh, Native Americans, they used to do about you know, anywhere between two and four times a year. Uh, they would get together for what we now refer to as a powwow. And the powwow is a place to exchange goods, a place to exchange stories. Where's the white man now? Dances, songs, and genetics, right? Get new men for your, your particular group, get new women for your group, right? And it's an opportunity to put some depth into that gene pool. Now, how many of you are married ladies? How many of you are not, who are not married want to get married? Yeah, a couple of you. Those of you that are married or want to get married, have you been planning your wedding since you're about eight years old? The church and the, all the bunting and all. And people do it less and less all the time. Have you ever considered what the Western wedding ceremony is? Where does the bride start in the typical Jewish, Christian, or Muslim wedding? Where does she, what, in what part of the building does she start? Up in the front of the auditorium or the back of the auditorium? In the back. And how does she get up to the front? Her father. And what is that process called? He is doing what? He's doing what? And there's another term for it. I heard it. Yeah, he's giving her away. Think about the words. Words have meaning, right? He's giving her away, implying that she is his property. Remember, even in the United States up until the 1970s, a single woman could not get credit. You could be 50 years old, have a PhD in economics, and no bank would give you a loan because you had ovaries instead of testicles. Your daddy would have to co-sign for you. We're not that far away from when women were technically property. And in many ways, where they're still treated as such. What's the first thing that the priest or the rabbi or the, or the mullah says when you get down to the front of, the, of the, the auditorium? What's the first thing he says? Who takes this woman, right? Daddy's going, get this bitch out of here. I'm not going to spend any more money on her. It's your problem now, right? And he's going, yeah, I'll take it on. Maybe in the getting to the point where he's willing to take on this woman, there have been other financial um, incentives. Right? In the majority of the world today, these payments, these marriage payments, still exist. The most common, and the one that would make the most sense to us in the West, is the dowry, where the woman brings a certain amount of payment with her, either to the groom's family, because they're losing they may lose that, um, that laborer because he may go off and form an, a new household and so they're losing that so they need payment for that. Or there may be a, a, a collection of things that she brings into the new household. Um, I don't know if they still do it. I think the company's still around. But uh, for years and years and years, for, de for decades, uh, there was a company called uh, Lane Cedar Chests. And they would sell to high school girls for their hope chest, a place to put their towels and their pillows and all the stuff they're going to get ready when they, for when they hope they get married. Right? That was the whole idea behind the hope chest, right? It was their trousseau. It was their dowry. Right? Today, in the West, we've simplified this. The bride's family pays for the wedding. It has devolved to that. It's still there. That dowry is still there. But it's in a slightly different form. The second one we refer to is bride wealth. This is exactly the same as the dowry, except it goes the other way. It comes from either the, bride, the groom's family or the groom himself. And it can either go to the bride's family to replace the loss of their daughter, or it can go to the household as part of building this new home. And then the final one is what we refer to as bride service. And we don't know of any where it goes the other direction. It's almost all, every, every instance we know of is the groom. And that's where you marry the woman, but you now owe her family labor probably for the rest of your life, right? It might be just coming and cutting the lawn, but you, you still have to keep paying for that woman no matter what. Of course, you always will, but that's another story. <coughs> now, what happens when a spouse dies? In our society, you go, well, they, uh, 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 they go to the old folks' home, right? 
Some societies make provisions. What happens when a spouse dies? Well, for the majority of human history, women have been property of men. So if a man dies, what does that make the woman? Who's going to own her? She has no rights by herself. So perhaps it would be something where um, there are provisions made. Oh, thank you. So what, 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 what is he bringing up? I thought it was a note. <laughs> it was like, I thought my fly was open or something. And he could have just told me through the headset. But no, he brought it up. Thank you, Nick. Um, so in these societies, they, we have what's called le leverit or sororit marriage. I'm married to a woman. We've got 17 kids. I die. My oldest male is nine. Who then can take care of that family in that type of a traditional situation? So rules are set up. In a leveret society, the husband's brother must marry and care for the wife and children of his brother. And if he's already married, that, because these are all polygamous uh, um, societies, so it's just another wife. But that's, that way, a, a male keeps control over the female in the family and the family's wealth. A sororate is the opposite, where you marry your wife's sister when, when your wife dies. Um, Again, that is, if you have children in the societies that do this, the man is responsible for the whole household, but the woman is the one that actually raises the children and cares for the house. The man, his responsibilities are outside of the house. And so he needs to get a wife. Well, the quickest and easiest way to do that is to marry your wife's sister, right? You don't have to break her in, call her the wrong name, at least you got the last name right, you know. So let's go through this again. Well, I'll bring one spouse to polygamy, several spouses. I guess that's species, right? Spouse species. Polygyny is several wives. This is the most common form of polygamy. One man, multiple wives. Could be because you have to marry your brothers and sisters. Could be just because that's the way the society is it. But even with polygamy, there are often restrictions. For example, in Islam, which is the largest polygamous group on the planet, um, there's a limit of four wives. Because prior to that, the tribal areas that Muhammad came to, there were no limits. People were marrying hundreds of women. They would dash off to the ne nearest uh, town and bring back as many as they could and put them in their harem. And so the four wives was a restriction, and you can only have four if, if you can treat each one fairly. Treat them all exactly the same. The Quran says you can have up to four wives as long as you treat them the same. Now, I can't treat the same woman fairly the same way day after day. If I had to do that with four, I would not know if I'd be able to do it. Right? We all have our feelings. A form of polygyny is sorrow um, polygyny, and that's when, you, when all of the wives are sisters, which is different than sister wives, which is something that like the Mormons do. Um, polyandry is where you have several husbands. Uh, you should be reading an article this week, I believe, uh, about um, people in Tibet, where this is a common practice, and there are reasons for it. And I'm so happy that this year, this semester, for really the first time, I've been teaching these classes here at Fresno State for over five years, I'm mean, almost my sixth year, and I've taught some of these classes at the UC a couple of years before that, and for the first time, we're this far into the semester, and no one is, is saying these people are weird. Right? You somehow manage to get uh, cultural relativity beaten into your brain the first few weeks. And you may be thinking these people are weird, but you're not putting them in your post. So at least we've made some progress. I appreciate that. Uh, fraternal polyandry is where you marry the brothers. That's, this is the way it's practiced in, in parts of Tibet. And then serial monogamy are like my father and my stepmother. My stepmother was married six times, my father was married three times, my mother was married three times. They just, just like to be married. Uh, I'm one of those who, yeah, it's okay. I like it. So, the translator? Okay. So, serial monogamy is one marriage right after. I asked my father one time, why 
you got great swapping, so they don't like me insane. <laughs> yes. So, you know, traditional marriage, assist marriage, becoming more traditional. It's not just the United States. I mean, places like Ireland, a very heavily Catholic country. Yeah, they got, they got same-sex marriage now. Lots of places have same-sex marriage, and they used to. This is actually from the program, Sister Wives. I couldn't get a good pro, a good photograph of actual uh, Mormons, but this is a, uh, a supposed to be a Mormon family that, that uh, you can see all of the different wives that he's acquired. None of those are his daughters; those are all wives. But even here today, I know of several people who are involved in what we refer to as throuples, where it's a couple plus one, either gender on the third person. And, they, and in one case, they actually went through and had a wedding ceremony in the whole nine yards so that everyone would be married to each other. One couple was already married. They had another ceremony to marry that person into their, their wedding, their marriage. Not legally binding, but there's at least the, the accoutrement of a tradition there. And speaking of tradition, you say, well, I'm a Christian, or I'm Jewish, or I want a traditional marriage. Which one? All eight of these are in the Bible. Monogamy is in the Bible. But so is polygamy. A man with his wives and concubines. Right? Then you have to marry him. He has to support him like a wife, but he doesn't have to marry him. Or a man and a woman and her property. If she owns females, you now have them as well. And it's not that she requires the property, because she's the same level of property that the slaves become part of your era. Man plus woman plus woman, you know, a big, big bunch of polygamy, that's also included. Uh, leverage marriage, marrying your brother's, your husband's brother, is in the Bible. In the Bible, if you are raped, you must marry your rapist. And you think, oh, that's awful. There are states in the South that have, keep trying to put this on the books. In fact, there are states in the United States today where the rapist has visitation rights of the offspring. And the rapist can determine whether or not the woman can even abort the pregnancy that he created. And where do they get the justification for that? From the Bible. Because it's traditional. You want a traditional marriage? Figure out that there are a bunch of different traditional marriages. Male soldier is prisoner of war. You just go to the next town, rape and pillage, bring them home, there are your wives. And then finally, there's a, a couple of cases in the Bible where slaves are told to marry other slaves. That's form. So there are at least eight forms of traditional marriage in the, in the Bible. Take a pick. Now, like I said, a lot of this is what people do, and we have labels for it. And the only reason that we have these labels is when we're talking about a culture where this is the norm. In a place like the United States or big parts of Europe, all of these happen all at the same time. You can still apply them, but they're not. But none of these is the cultural norm. In this country, it used to be the neo-local was the norm, and it's still primarily that's an independent household, one, two adults, and the offspring. That's a neo-local household. A vera or patrilocal household is where you live with the groom's parents. Uh, in other words, forming a, an extended family where you're the second generation, your parents are the first generation in that home. When one of them dies, they will become then the, essentially the ancestors. Don't move out of the big bedroom. You, If you're the oldest son and, and the bride, you'll move into the big room. You become the head of the household. They become just one of the family. So there's a, a whole cultural thing that goes along with where you stay. The same is true in Oxora local or Matra local. The bride's family that you live with. Above your local is where you live with the groom's mother's brother. It's one of those societies where the uncles have responsibility that even the parent, even the, the couple don't have. So they go live with the groom's mother's brother, the maternal uncle. By local is where you split. Six months in mom's house, six or six months in the mom's house, six months in the dad's house. Any of these, can exist, all of these exist in our society um, somewhere. 
Uh, but they're not, you know, the, the norm for our stem cell. So let's go back to there. So again, a nuclear family, you know, what we have, in, what we claim to have in this country, two adults and 2.3 kids, or 2.4 kids, or whatever it happens to be this, this, this decade. Um, that's it. An extended family is when there are two or more generations. So it might be you, if, if you are living at home right now, and you're younger than your parents, and you're your parents home, then you are, you're living in an extended family situation. For the majority of human history, that was the norm. It wasn't until the end, after World War II, that we started telling Americans, you got to, at 18, you got to go get your apartment. You've got to go get a home. Right? Don't stay at home with your parents. Get off your lazy ass and move out. Who, who does that benefit? The people who build apartments. The people who make the furniture, the good thing, you know, right? If, if everybody's staying in, in, in households, you're not getting all those new houses. You need immigrants or more, more children for that to happen. Right? And so there's an economic reason why we have promoted since World War II single family homes. Prior to World War II, even up into the 50s and in the earliest parts of the 60s, single people didn't, buy, didn't rent apartments. Most of them, if they didn't live at home, either lived in boarding houses which is where a family would have a house with a bunch of bedrooms, and they would rent those bedrooms out and feed their, their, their renters. Or they lived in hotels where they had a place to sleep. The room probably had a bathroom or, or, or at least a sink with a bathroom in the hall. And there was a restaurant in the hotel, and that was part of your, you, you, you pay for it was when you pay for your rent. Um, or some arrangement like that, or they generally lived with family. It is an economic, there is an economic reason to get you out of the household. And that's so we can sell you all those things you need because that's what stimulates the economy. And so this got to rush off and do it. Now, your generation isn't doing it as much. Most of you are not, many of you are not moving out. You're staying longer, which is perfectly fine. Economically, it makes sense. And why, I mean, it, 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 and again, it is much more traditional to stay at home. You're 30 years old, you're still at home. If you're not married, you don't really need to move out. Historically, never been the push. Much more recent. So the extended family, and then, of course, is the multiple generations. A virile local extended family is when, you're, when it's just your father's side of the family. So you move into your father's uh, ancestral home, and you become part of that family. Your mother's family you may not even be part of anymore. Very often, depending on the culture, one of the spouses, usually the, the bride, sometimes the groom, no longer remains part of the original family. That, that, that family is cut off, and then it all goes to one other, on the other side. And an oxylorical or matrilaural, uh, oxylorical or matrilaural, is um, when you were saying your mother's side of the family. All right, we got where you live. We got who you can marry. Now, we got to figure out who inherits. Right? Inheritance is money. It can also be power. There are power dynamics in families. And you know, many times, it's all, oh, he's the patriarch of the family. Everybody goes to him. That's where they borrow the money. That's where they get the permission to get married or whatever. Depending on the family and how your family works, you may or may not have that type of situation. So when we're talking about descent, we want to know to whose family do you belong? Do you belong to the mother's family? Do you belong to the father's family? Or do you belong to both? Now in the West, we are bilineal. We descend from both our mother and our father. But many cultures only do one side. Most cultures, they do it through the father. Some, especially matrilineal or matriarchal uh, societies, it's called matrilineal because it goes through the mother. Right? You belong to your mother's family. Jewishness, the inheritance of, of the Jewish race, is passed on through the mother. It has nothing to do with the father. It all has to do with that, that descent comes through uh, the mother. So that's matrilineal. So, bilineal descent is what we do. Unilineal descent is where you do it with one parent or the other. And then another thing to kind of throw into here is a clan, which is an extended family that's even more extended, right? You go family, clan, tribe, and the rest of the world. This gets so confusing. These are something that you almost never ever use. 
just going to go through it for completeness. If you are talking about the children of two sisters or two brothers, not together, they can't be engaged. But if you're talking about the, all of the children of this sister and this sister, they would be called parallel cousins because they're of the, they're from the same gendered parent, right? Same as they were both men, it's brothers and sisters. Cross cousins are the opposite. A brother and a sister have children, not together with their own respective spouses, and those cousins are those children are considered cross cousins. In the modern world, a lot of these get jumbled up because technology. Number one. Over the last 25, 30 years, especially here in the United States, we've seen a huge change in the attitude towards parenting. Even into the 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, you pop a kid out of wedlock, it's a bastard. And you're frowned, it's frowned upon. Today, pretty much, I mean, each family is a little different, but today, pretty much, the majority of children uh, are not. I, I'd have to look at that statistic, yeah, but it's getting close to it. Uh, pretty much an even split of non-majority children are actually born out of it. Because marriage is something that a lot of us aren't doing anymore. I, I ask you all who want to get married, and very few of you actually really care. So non-marital parenting has an impact on a lot of these traditions. Adoption. Adoption is one of those, what kind did I say it was? Yeah, it was the second one. What was that? A finial. Right? A finial. Uh, it's an affinial uh, uh, situation. Um, anybody here know anybody who's adopted? Do they, uh, do they have issues with their parents? You know, do they question? They wonder why they were adopted or anything like that? Yeah. I, my, I have a daughter who's, uh, I think she turned 40 this year, who was put up for adoption three days when she, after she was born. Um, she struggled for a long time trying to figure out where she belonged. Um, and when she turned 18, she came back, she came down to Crescent. She lived in Sacramento with her family. She came down here, lived with her birth mother for a while, and I only lived a quarter mile away, so um, we spent some time together. But it took her a long time to realize that her real parents were the people who raised her. And Kathy and I, we produced the raw material, but we had nothing, nothing to do. Uh, it was strange because her mother, Kathy, she and her mother have some ticks and some movements and stuff. They're almost identical, even the way they phrase things. Even though know, they didn't, she didn't grow up right now. There are, she did inherit certain traits, but not really personality traits, just little, little strange ticks. You go, yeah, your mother does that. Yeah, that type of thing. Um, but it took her a long time to figure out what the relationship was. Uh, artificial insemination. If, you use, if you're using the biological material from both parents, then there's no question. But what if you're using sperm from, say, Denmark, the number one exporter of, of sperm in the world? I don't know why, but that's, the, that's their number. That's one of the, the largest. The largest importer of sperm is Denmark. Don't know why. Um, the, uh, but if you're using someone else's sperm, whose kid is it? Especially if you don't even know who the father is. Donated egg is the same thing. Now, if, it's, if you're using a surrogate and you're using somebody else's egg and the husband's sperm and someone else is carrying it, whose kid is it? Different cultures would claim it different ways. And much of this is still not even covered in most countries by law. They don't have laws legalizing it. They don't have laws controlling it. They don't have laws protecting it. And so a lot of these things go kind of wonky in other places. Now, parenthood has lots and lots of dynamics. I mentioned my daughter, Jenna. I am her genitor. And Kathy is her genetrix. But the people who raised her are her pater and her mater. And it isn't that we're just speaking German. We actually use these two terms very specifically. So for my son, I am both the genitor and the pater. But my wife is only the mater of my son, not of my daughter. And how do we track kindred? Well, we use that. We use good old family trees. And this is actually not the kind of use I'll talk about it in just a minute. Um, 
So kindred is those people to whom we are related. By blood, by adoption, by, um, by deciding to be related. And we track this, and this is often done, and I did the, I, I've had to do this several times for some of the communities that I worked in because they, family means a lot. Um, we refer to it as egocentric because when an individual does it, he starts, he or she starts with themselves. And this is an egocentric chart. So right here, if this was my chart, I would go here. And here would be my stepsister, and here would be my half-sister, and here would be her half-brother, and here would be her half-brother, and then all of the parents would be above it. Right? But you start with you. Or if you're starting, if you're out in the field doing research and you want to tra trace it, you would start with whoever genealogy you're trying to get. But it's basically just go through now. Very often in intro classes I have a couple week project where students actually produce their, their charts. It's fascinating. Uh, nobody has a traditional family. I, 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 I don't know how many times I've had that assignment, but I've never seen 2.3 kids, or even just three kids, I've never seen just a standard straight, sometimes the family of the, the actual individual is pretty cool, but the moment you get to the next family over, you know, the siblings of the parents or something like that, it gets all the hell. 